Welcome to episode 12 of The Lowdown Show. I'm Neil Graham. This week, my guest is an old friend. Uh, he's been on this podcast before, Michael Ularek. Uh, Michael uh, lives in Nova Scotia, oddly enough, drives a Cordoba and a VW bus, owns a Ducati, an old one, and uh, is a former designer with GK Design in Amsterdam, which is Yamaha Motorcycles' official design house. He's done work with Piaggio. He's also an industry pundit. Uh, he's a really smart guy, speaks a bunch of languages, can draw, which, you know, really makes me resent him because I can't draw a thing. And uh, this week we're going to argue about a bunch of different things, including parallel twins, which he defends, which I think are defenseless. And uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of motorcycle design. Uh, we're going to stoke the fires of everyone out there and talk about electric propulsion. Uh, but don't fear, it's all sort of semi lighthearted. Uh, but before we dive in, a word from our sponsor, eBay Motors is here for the ride. With some elbow grease, fresh installs, and a whole lot of love, you transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own. Brake kits, LED headlights, whatever you need, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only and naturally exclusions apply. Shall we take the plunge? Michael, you and I agree on on too many things. In fact, as as vintage Ducati owners and VW bus owners, we have the same issues, which is which is worrisome for me. <laughs> We're w- worrisome at home in our household too. Yeah. So, but it always gives me comfort when I find things that we don't agree on. And uh, recently, I was talking to someone on the podcast, and we both slagged parallel twin engines. And uh, oh, there's Kitty. And uh, yes. And you came to the, the defense of the parallel twin, which I think is a defenseless engine configuration. Um, so defend the parallel twin, please. With with pleasure. You're not going to like this, Neil. Um, That's the whole point of this. It's it's going to get personal. <laughs> and you're, so, I know you're going to give me a corporate packaging answer, and that's no, not the answer no, that I want. No, no, no. I, I'm making it personal. Coming after <laughs> you, Neil. Okay, go um, ahead. Okay, so the, the the factual answer, not the corporate answer. Corporate answer that someone like Ryan on F9 would say that it's cheaper. Yeah, that's partly true. Uh, that is true. But that's not the reason why the Parallel Twin is probably the best engine configuration um, currently available in combustion. Uh-oh. If by best, by best, it means the best compromise. <gasps> so that's the thing. Compromise is not a dirty word. Compromise is what adults do. Now, you just mentioned that we both own hopeless vehicles, so maybe we're not adults. But um, if you're trying to make a vehicle that is that has a great package, that allows it to be short wheelbase, relatively inexpensive, got good low-end torque for the kind of riding that 90% of people do 90% of the time, um, has a good sound, um, you know, and there are such a long list of reasons why the parallel twin makes sense. Um, and then the reason we fall in love with other configurations is because they're fundamentally and deeply flawed. Um, you know, more cylinders is generally better for efficiency, um, which is why race bikes are four cylinder, whether they're V configuration or not. But, you know, you're you're going to come at this. I, I heard your your conversation. You talked about character. Did you not own a Norton Commando? <laughs> Was that Commando not? Is is the Commando, and all are all those British parallel twins that have still got defenders even today? Are those not characterful motorcycles? And not because they fall apart and leak. They. The character came from the engine, and you know the Laverda parallel twin is a is a freak thing that I owned because I'm a freak. Um, but like two cylinder engines are fantastic when they're in line for all the reasons already understood. It works in two stroke. R R Z series Yamaha, some of the most beloved, not just successful. Are we are, 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 we, de- are, we, de- are we devolving into two strokes? I think they need it. Can, they I, tell, can I tell you my can I tell you my favorite two-stroke story? I was I was uh, I was complaining about two-strokes once, and uh, somebody said to me in an English accent, of course, which makes everything seem that much haughtier. 
He said to me, <laughs> he said, there's only, he said, the, the two stroke is beautiful. There are only three moving parts. Piston, a con rod, and a crankshaft. I mean, you know, give or take. That's excluded transmission for the sure, purpose of sure. this conversation. And my answer to that was, yes, but there are three parts that hate each other. They do <laughs> The, a, a piston in a two-stroke is at war with the cylinder bore. That's why they yes. stick to each other because they don't like each other and somebody's going to die. Well, um, and, and eventually, like every toxic relationship, the piston and the bore destroy. It's a mutually destructive scenario. There's, there are, there's no winner there. Um, no. They both lose. No. Yeah. Yes. yes. But look, the, the P2 is a fantastic format from an emotive Oh, is that sorry. is that sorry? P two is a parallel twin. Par sorry, parallel twin. Yeah, is is a yeah, okay. uh, is is great. And and the only reason that the V twin, L twin for the the fussy, um, the configuration exists at all today, is because of Ducati and Harley Davidson. Neither of which are particularly famous, and this is going to also be controversial, for their you know packaging or technological prowess. You know, Ducati's V-Twin, which I own, I am a hypocrite, um, is a packaging nightmare. A 90-degree V-Twin is, is is tough, which is why they don't race them. You know, Ducati, they don't even race their 90-degree their twin um, or twin although of any kind. Although they race a 90-degree four, as does everyone. Yes, this is true. Um, but the, the two-cylinder format, which you're arguing for, doesn't produce a reasonable amount of power for its physical size and displacement. The only reason Ducati won all those world championships, the only reason is because they got to cheat. When you get a 33% displacement boost, and when the Japanese made their V-twin, they kicked their butt. So, you know, and then dropped the mic and said, this is a stupid racing series and a, and a, and a really dumb engine, uh, which didn't sell. Um, so, you know, the, are you the are you talking, you're talking about the RC51 at yes all? which yeah. is an amazing motorcycle um and and you know v-twins work but there's no reason why v-strom wouldn't work as well as a parallel twin it would actually cost less for the manufacturer ergo cost less for you um and in fact Suzuki's entire mid middle class lineup the new ones are all parallel twins that are not available in North America it's a shocker um, but they're all 500 cc parallel twins um and they're they meet all the criteria and i'll just look if you hate them so much why did you resuscitate that norton was it some is there is there more to that story i, I well i actually went straight to my midlife crisis from adolescence um, <laughs> i cut out the middleman and went straight there um I, well you know the it's interesting because i think that it's, it's a good point the i think the english twins were were, well, of course, 360 degree twins. So both pistons go up and down together, which is out of vogue now. That doesn't really happen with these modern parallel twins. And and out of sync with engineering sanity, but you know, let's leave yeah. that for the moment. We don't we don't need to. Well, you know, there there's England was they lost the war or lost the war. They won the war but lost everything else. Um and I think that, you know, it's essentially the Norton is a 19, well, we've joked about this. It's kind of a 1938 engine configuration that somehow made yes. it limped, in, limped into the 70s. But for some reason, the long stroke um, parallel twins, although they were, you know, had so many issues. Like the Norton, I mean, the Norton, it, it would shake so much that if the ISO, you know, because the Norton is, for those that don't know, and you're lucky if you don't know this, <laughs> because you haven't wasted your life like I have. <laughs> Which is that the the Norton was a was a came the engine came from the Atlas where it was solidly mounted went to the Commando and they came up with this massive rubber mounting system with shims, basically kind of a massive bungee cord to hold it in the frame, and if you didn't and you you would set it with feeler gauges like you'd set a valve, but if you didn't leave enough uh, clearance and you did it too tight, which would improve the handling, you could actually break the frame. The vibration would break the frame, and and it, but the, I mean the only thing that, that had the commando had going for it was um, it, it sounded really good, really good. But I'm not it sure looked, that the, it looked great too. Looked like a proper right. motorcycle, a good looking engine. 
It's a good looking. It's a handsome yeah. engine. Uh, most old engines yeah. are pretty handsome. Um, I but isn't it curious that that you know I, I just think the V configure. I mean, my favorite engine of all time is the sixty five degree V four in the Aprilia, which I think is just the bomb. And I mean, as an and, and I think my see my beef is that I think you you think too much like a person who has to make a motorcycle, whereas I'm just a I'm just a punter in the stands, and I mm-hmm. you know and I like what I like, and I just. I just think the parallel twin, I mean, first of all, why did it come back? Because it was dead, pretty much dead, other than just little. Oh, that's, I, I can, I can answer that very easily. And, and for all those mundane reasons that you've, you've besotted me with, um, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> the mundane reasons like making money and having reliable product and keeping companies alive. So all the companies that make characterful motorcycles at some point go bankrupt or very close. And, you know, the rest of them, mostly being Japanese, you know, plot along making three, four percent profit every year for seven decades. Um, it's not it's not like radical thinking here. The parallel twin never left. OK, it left North American consciousness because from, the you know, the post Cold War era, we had this, you know, from 1990, roughly to 2008 financial crisis, the motorcycle market exploded with with the prosperity that came in that era a lot of cheap money we've talked about it ad nauseum boomers had come later in life had time had money great so brands like harley davidson made off like bandits ducati was resuscitated in 93 by by texas specific group which did great work uh resuscitating that brand um and so they popularized these other configurations but my whole career like the the phaser the the fzs yamaha was always going to be a four cylinder, but there was going to be a smaller entry level vehicle. It was going to be a P two, uh, a parallel twin, and you know Suzuki, I think deserves the credit more than Ducati for making the modern liquid cooled V twin a viable, almost dominant format because they came out with the SV, you know the TL one thousand. Yes, but after that they they made a smaller version, the six fifty, which that 650 and later 1000 version powered Italian bikes by Kajiva. They, they powered Kawasaki's, they powered Suzuki's. They, you know, sold that template to Hyosung um, a long time ago. Like it's just, it's in the V-Strom, it's in road bikes, it's in everything. Um, and it's a great engine. Suzuki make fantastic product. Um, and because it was accessible, uh, it, it sort of made this idea that, you know, a V-twin could be. Aprilia went to V-Twin only because marketing decided, well, if we're we're considered the other Ducati. That was the only reason, you know, um, you know, that's that's why the parallel twin never left. It was always the mainstay of of what we would call, you know, commuter bikes uh, in North America, which the rest of the world calls a motorcycle. Um, and the Japanese sold hundreds of thousands of parallel twins throughout that 90s, 2000s period, um, you know, and it kind of came back, so to speak, because after 08, I don't think a lot of consumers realized, especially in America, that we we came very close to losing the motorcycle industry the way we see it here as a luxury good, as a 600cc, 1000cc, 1500cc, whatever your flavor. Um, Harleen very nearly... Uh, was was knocked off by that event. Yamaha came very close to bankruptcy. Um, now this would never happen because those brands are sacred, and you know saviors were made, were found. But um, we, the industry never went back. That's why sport bikes stopped getting all the high end finishes from factory. That's why old models that were supposed to be replaced before that period every four years. It became six years, became eight years, became 10 years. So um, the parallel twin is back because it's economical. And because, and here's the, here's my mic drop on this subject. Most people don't care. Most consumers of motorcycles, even in the, the Americas, don't know the difference between a parallel twin and a V twin, a four cylinder, three cylinder. They don't know. Single-sided swing arms, does it have a linkage? What does that even mean? They look at a bike, they like a brand, they respond to the brand, they respond to the look, it fits their pocketbook, they pull the trigger. 
Um, and whether, I mean, I had a senior product planner explain this to me in like the early 2000s, said these consumers, they say they care, they read about it after the purchase, and then they repeat whatever the boiler plant is for their product. So if you if the consumer mostly doesn't care, the manufacturer is going to pick the best fit, which is a parallel twin. I sometimes think that, uh, yeah, that makes sense. I, I understand that. But I sometimes think that uh, my totally non-scientific seat of the pants had a few drinks interpretation of all this <laughs> is that is that as we are, uh, and this will lead into our next discussion, but it's almost as, as they lost their enthusiasm for internal combustion. It's like, uh, let's stick them with a parallel twin. We can power it. We can, we can power a drone with it or a water pump. You know, I mean, it, it'll do everything. It can be a generator. And I know that's not very kind of me, but, um, I'm not that kind. <laughs> you know, look, one of the most beloved engines in motorcycling is the Moto Guzzi transverse V-twin. It was designed for a tractor, for a three-wheeled military carry-all vehicle. So sometimes the heart wants what it wants. You know, it, it, people love things for rational but often irrational reasons. Guess what? It turns out that the Tonyon designed, you know, good CV twin is actually a very good motorcycle engine. If the motorcycle is, doesn't need to go, you know, doesn't need to win races and it's reliable. It, the packaging is actually pretty good. It has torque steer, but you know, BMW riders don't seem to mind too much about that. So, you know, sometimes engines are born because of necessity or because of some capricious decision at the at the factory level that has nothing to do with the product. I mean, and in the end, we end up benefiting um, tremendously. I mean, the single cylinder engine is just cheap, but it can be full of character. And I know you have feelings about singles too. That's for another day. eBay Motors is here for the ride. For this uh, week's fireside chat, um, I'm going to talk about something that's kind of awkward. And uh, I think if you're a starlet um, and you go to a premiere or some sort of fancy party, the biggest tragedy you can have is if you find another woman wearing the same dress that you are. It's horrifying because you're supposed to be, you know, unique. Uh, and but you know, for those of us a little down market from starlets, um, I think my version of that is when you find people who have the same vehicles you do. So, for instance, I used to go to a racetrack, and there'd be a guy that would show up with a VW bus like mine, pulling a Ducati like mine, and naturally we were very suspicious of each other because it's like, what went wrong in your life to guide you to two really quirky things: Italian motorcycles and extremely slow, you know, sixty-five horsepower cars. Um, so that was a little awkward. Now, the resonance of this for Michael and I is that Michael has a VW bus and a Ducati. We have essentially the same Ducati, a 900 SS. He has a Vanagon, where I have the earlier version. Um, but it doesn't mean he's more sensible than I am. But it is a, pecu a peculiar thing, rather, when you find that. And I don't really know what I think about it. Although, uh, I think maybe I think too much about these things. That could, that could be it, really. Now, uh, before we get back to my interview with Michael, a few words from our sponsor. With over 122 million parts, you can make sure your number one ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof racks, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, and naturally, exclusions will apply. You're listening to The Lowdown Show. I want to talk about electrification. And I know this is something that's very uh, near to you. You've, you've developed uh, an electric superbike in your past, which is right over your shoulder. And, um, but it seems to me, and I know that electrification is, is, has become this absurd issue. A propulsion system has now become yeah. a, pol a political issue, yeah. which is that if, if you drive a Dodge Ram diesel with a 12 inch exhaust pipe, you're a Trump supporter and a Republican. And if you drive a Tesla, you, you voted for, you know, Joe Biden. Um, not much of a choice right there, actually. 
but um but the the it seems like that the at least from what I read and what I understand that there has been a bit of a slowdown on on the sort of urge to move electric, and it seems like there's there's it seems like with any the advent of any new technology there is an over enthusiasm perhaps or an enthusiasm that may not be initially justified, and I wonder is that is that what's going on now with electrification that that it was sort of like this magic panacea and now it's like okay well you know we need infrastructure. We have to know uh, where the electricity is coming from to charge these things. Is it coming from coal? And it, it, I wonder if we just, if we jumped over a lot of steps, maybe a little too quickly before we rationally discussed electrification of vehicles. It's a lot to unpack in that. Are we talking? <laughs> uh, so I, I, I would, yeah. Uh, I, so first of all, automobiles, dominate the conversation electric cars dominate the conversation because of course they do they scale of their size of uh, economics required to produce automobiles is is you know roughly well, what, what, hang on what, why, don't, why don't we make this about the electric motorcycle because because we can yeah. get too off topic so because exactly. obviously motorcycles are difficult because they're small yeah ish you know and, and so and yeah yeah, battery, yeah absolutely and batteries are heavy and and you know, I, it, I think the, the realistic packaging issues, um, you know, like uh, the designer I just spoke to recently, he said that, and it, he echoed your sentiments, which is that if it has a small fuel tank currently, and if it's a sub 200 cc, that's something that electrification can do. Yeah. But but what about the, you know, the, and this always cycles around when you, whenever there's anything on ADV Rider, you know, there's always lots of comments saying, well, well, okay, if it, when it can do what my V-Strom 650 can do, which with its fine V-twin liquid-cooled motor, um, then then I'm all in. So w when is that day going to happen? When, when can we? When is there going to be a reliable charging system that can that can charge our bikes in you know 15, 10 or 15 minutes that that we can get I don't know 300 kilometers range out of? Like when is that going to well, happen? Well, you're, got, you're very lucky because I have an answer. It's August 14th, 2031. That's the day when you can replace your V-Strom 650. Um, I, I love this kind of line of thinking because it's so divorced from reality that I, I really, I stopped arguing about it a long time ago. So for but the what purposes- reality, Explain the reality to me and then explain why you're disagreeing with it. Well, the reality is, it would be like arguing, like, look, I'm not, I'm going to be, someone's going to jump up and down my throat. The guys, you know, whatever. Look, I have combustion vehicles. I got a Ducati. I drive a, I have my, our hobby car is a Cordoba with a 7.9 liter V8. So I, I, I'm not like Sexy. ideologically, Sexy. you know it, Chrysler, um, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I, well, I just answer my question. Just answer my question. I want to know when, when, okay. when. And I'm not. And I'm not being reactionary. I'm not saying that. No, that, no. The that, answer that, is that, look. The answer is it'll happen in about ten or fifteen years. And before someone says you know that's a bullshit answer, then the end. Look, my response to that is currently, and for the last 50, 70 years, ninety-eight percent. This is a number you could take to the bank. Ninety-eight percent of the six hundred million motorcycles on Earth are vehicles that have less than 10 horsepower, okay? That's the frame of reality. Reality is that the motorcycle, be it a moped or a small motorcycle, 400cc motorcycle, the, the use case for the overwhelming majority of motorcycles on this planet is already far exceeded by the capability of battery power today. And it has been for five or six years. The economics of it are done. Like the only, the, there are values that combustion bring to developing markets where, you know, gasoline is still easier to get in some places than, than reliable electricity, for instance. Um, that being said, like India and China, electrification is going up double digits. China is over 50%. What are we even talking about? Those two countries alone represent the vast majority of motorists on two and four wheels. So, you know, to the to come back to your question. So you enjoy one, you, me, we enjoy taking long rides, 
riding for three hours, stopping for 20 minutes, having a quick break, a coffee, whatever, continuing riding another two, three hours. The gold wing consumer, the, 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 the 1700 CCV twin consumer. Well, that's a niche market. They will be able to enjoy their combustion vehicles forever because no one's coming to pry it from their hands. They just won't be able to buy a new one with combustion in 2030 or 2035, depending where they live. Maybe it's 2040, um, but it won't be. It'll be 2030, 2035. And by then, I mean, your previous guest, I mean, this is just objectively true. Batteries are gaining about 5 to 8% capacity for the same volume year on year. And that's not uh, waiting for some big transformational new technology. That's the existing chemistry. That's the existing layout. So combustion isn't getting more efficient. There's no panacea. We never promised that. People who did were naive. People who said this is going to save the earth were also a little naive. But, you know, it costs less electricity, just electricity, to charge an electric vehicle of any kind than the amount of electricity it takes to produce and deliver a liter of gasoline or diesel. So the, the argument is idiotic, and I'm not going to engage in statistics because, you know, he said, she said, you know, the, the fact is the entire banking community on Earth has moved down this path. If the financer, financial world is 100% all in on electrification, we're going there. Because those people have the resources. They direct where resources go. So, you know, and that's worldwide. Here's my theory. Manufacturers are giving us parallel twins. So we, abs <laughs> so we absolutely lose Have faith to. in internal internal combustion. It's like, oh God, if, if, if it's going to be a parallel twin, let's just go electric. It's a good theory. I like it. <laughs> and by the way, I'm, I'm paid a lot by secret societies to uh, within the industry to say these things. So you found me out. It's uh, it's the deep state ultimately, isn't it? <laughs> it's the deep Suzuki. Yes. <laughs> the deep Suzuki. All right. I think we've exhausted this one. <laughs> or exhausted each other you're listening to the lowdown show presented by advrider.com and supported by ebaymotors.com michael i want to talk about uh motorcycle racing and not not just uh not just the, the notion of 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 you know who's on what bike and who's winning not that but the, but the justification for racing um i know that uh, moto gp which is the uh premier road racing series, you know, equivalent to Formula One on two wheels, give or take, only it's interesting. Formula One is not in my estimation. Um, but it's, there have been restrictions. I know that in 2027, there's going to be a new rule package. And I think they're going from a thousand to 850 CC and they're, you know, they're limiting that some of the technologies that can be used. Um, I think they're more aero restrictions and like the starting devices where the bikes sink down till they're, you know, three millimeters off yeah. the pavement, all that stuff's going away. Yeah, yeah. So so is there, I mean, I, I love racing because of the, the, the purity of it. And I, I think MotoGP bikes, I think are beautiful. They're, they're, they're not pretty, but they're beautiful because of they're just pure technology. And what do you think about a, a series like that bringing in restrictions, like cost cutting? Like they, they have tire limitations, like the amount of cubic amount of money they spend and they limit them on tires, which seems absurd to me. Um, so should a, should a prototype series just be unregistered, un unregulated like that? Or, or I don't know. What do you think? You follow this stuff. I do. And, and look, racing is, I, I agree. I love MotoGP. I love, you know, Superbike. Uh, you know, I was really a Superbike guy long before I was interested. I only became interested in MotoGP when I started working in, in motorcycle manufacturing. Um, Restrictions are a reality, and that's not new. Well, they've been imposing restrictions since forever. I mean, you know, I can't speak to the 60s, but, you know, there was a point at which MV Agusta won every 350 and every 500 class race. And, you know, at some point, even they started getting penalties, like added, like weight 
restrictions and things like this. This is normal. It's the same reason why if, you know, in human sport, you know, we categorize boxers by, by weight, by muscle mass, uh, because we all recognize it would be ridiculous, you know, uh, if, if, you know, one person is so hilariously overpowering the other. So the tire restriction, I can't comment on, but I, I, you know, I disagree with you in this regard. I, I think it's essential to, to frankly dumb down uh, racing at some level, because while these technologies often translate into some benefit to the to us on the street, this is a myth that you know race on Sunday makes a better pro product uh, product for you and the end consumer. Almost nothing in Formula One has ended up in passenger cars. You know what's been imp a massive improvement in passenger cars? Airbags. You know, analog brakes. Those things have made us safer. It is, they've saved millions of lives. They have actually reduced the financial burden on society by not having impaled people. You know, Formula One doesn't bring innovation that's useful to you driving your midsize SUV to Costco. Like, that's just fantasy. That's marketing. And motorcycles but, are no but, different. But but what about uh, so, what about things what about superbike racing for instance things like traction control and uh, I mean that that certainly came from racing yeah right? no that's true okay I mean you know granted I'll give you that one you know TC has has had a you know but you know TC was invented in automotive a long time ago it transformed it transferred over to motorcycle uh, late um, and you know yeah it's true you know that that does that's a good example that contradicts me here but when it comes to restrictions. Like Superbike at one point was a competitor, the series, I mean, was a competitor to MotoGP when MotoGP went from two stroke to four stroke, from Grand Prix to, to MotoGP. And, and MotoGP, people may not know this, was losing more fans, more money, more sponsors, more participants were in World Superbike for a couple of years there than, than in, in, in MotoGP. Um, and, you know, part of the reason was that the format was more, you know, it's the races, you, know, you have double headers, you, have, you get more bang for your buck. And the bikes, you know, Carl Fogarty wins on a Ducati 916. I can go out and buy something that approximates the bike he raced, you know, or a ZX-7 or whatever. Um, and, you know, the Grand Prix two-strokes prototypes, like they made no, there was nothing connecting them to the bikes you and I could buy. When MotoGP started to get serious you know one of the things they did was you know kind of make you know honda styled their rcv to look like the street bike and then i was at yamaha at the time we did the same thing i actually worked on that first sort of mild conversion um and the the connection that the consumer had with racing became more tangible more real what happens under the skin the software you're talking about, all this technology to the consumer is just blah, blah, blah. It's no different than, you know, the 80s when the Japanese came up with acronyms like XUP, you know, and put it on the side of the bike and, you know, SRAD for Suzuki or whatever, these, these technologies, you know, they were layouts, they were minor innovations in, in engine configuration or whatever. That's what moves people. The perception of technology, the perception of high performance, because most people on the street aren't going to use even the performance that was available 30 years ago, never mind what's available today. So MotoGP costs too much. Manufacturers are really quite happy to leave. You know, Honda and Yamaha are in it forever because they're locked in a Titanic struggle that would make a Greek mythologist blush. Um, but the others, Suzuki, Kawasaki, couldn't care less. BMW's made a hash of it. KTM, you know, how many years are they going to shovel money into a program that loses money? Yeah, they won a few races, but really they're going to, they're going to in it for the long haul. You know, so the only way to keep the, the series alive is to have manufacturers in it. The only way to have manufacturers in it is to lower the cost for them, not for us, for them. Because even Honda at some point can say, if Honda decides to leave, that's the end of MotoGP, the, the end, even though they're not winning right now. So, you know, because they bring in the, you know, they sell the bikes. 
So that's why the restrictions come in. And I don't think it's going to have a material impact on, on either sales or the fandom. So the interesting thing, I, I one of the interesting things about MotoGP in, in recent years is the is the domination by European manufacturers. I mean, you know, I mean, Repsol Honda was, you know, the team. It was the it was the Ferrari equivalent of motorcycle racing. You know, the, what Ferrari is to F one, just in terms of its cachet, only more successful than Ferrari. But the, in terms of cachet, now, you know, the, the, usually the last two bikes running in any race are, are Hondas. And, and Yamaha has struggled hugely in recent years. Yeah. What has happened there? Why, why, why do the Europe, even Aprilia, uh, I mean, I just came, a little aside here, I just came back from a motorcycle dealer that wasn't a, a Piaggio Aprilia Moto Guzzi dealer uh, where I live. And they're no longer. And I said, you know, what's up? And they said, well, you know, we had to wait a couple of years for parts sometimes. <laughs> and so they're selling more, you know, four wheelers. So, and I think, well, isn't that interesting? And, and and yet, Aprilia has a successful MotoGP racing team. And of course, when Ducati is dominant, and KTM's doing all right. And and yet, the the Japanese are massively struggling to the point where it's just humiliating. Even I feel bad for them, which is which is something. So, what's going on? What why why are the Japanese so lost in terms of racing? Well, they're busy making money. Um, <laughs> No, I, I'm sorry. It, Honda last year had its second best year in history. And I got to correct you. Honda is Honda. They're the greatest of all time, period. That's just no, a no, but fact. I'm talking right, I'm talking right now in terms of racing. Well, so what? Ducati won <laughs> one, one world championship in 2007. And you would think that, you know, Christ had <laughs> descended from the heavens. Like, look, it was glorious. I was in Europe at the time. I fall, I went to four races every year. It was glorious. It was epic. I liked watching Casey Stoner. I loved the battles. They were, the bikes were beautiful. I, they earned it. But, you know, this is like the 1970-whatever Imola win a 750S. Like, whatever. The Yamaha TZ750 was a better motorcycle than Yamaha M1 struggling right now. But let's not forget that Yamaha won, what, eight world championships in a row? Honda then with Marquez, the same thing. But why this? They're why in, this, why they're this in the long haul. No, they're in it for the long haul. They, you know, I'm not making excuses for them. I'm just telling you how it is. The Japanese factories that are still in MotoGP are prioritizing what they always have prioritized. Racing is there to support the business. Aprilia's business, I'm not sure what it is. They're part of Piaggio. Piaggio Group is listless. They have some good years. They have a lot of bad years. Aprilia as a brand is essentially non-existent. As you said, there are no, practically no dealers. They have catastrophic quality control problems. And I love Aprilia. I owned Aprilius. I, it was my first choice when I left school to work for them. And I, I'm grateful to the fact that I did. I did work for Aprilia as a designer for a couple of years uh, as a consultant. Um, but they're not a good business. So who cares? KTM is a more serious company. And, you know, kudos to them. Ducati's doing very well. Great. Their sales are, as usual, Modest growth, a little bit flat. If you look over a 10-year arc, if you look over a 10-year arc where Honda and Yamaha are, it's not the same thing at all. So, I mean, at the end of the day, are you going to spend 100 million euros to win a couple of races? Is it going to move the needle on 70 or 100,000 scooters or, or small motorcycles in Vietnam? No. Okay, but you're, you're, not, answering my question. you're not answering my question. Why, why, why are they struggling? Like, what's going on? Yeah, resource and, and, allocation. That's it. So they're not that they're not that they're not putting the money into it. I mean, you can you hear that from their own riders. You know that you know the R and D is slow. And look, it's, that's not to take away from Ducati. Ducati has an amazing team, and and by that I mean the R and D on the on the MotoGP side. Most of whom, like Gigi, are ex Aprilia, the old Aprilia when Aprilia was winning, you know, 37 world championships in a row in 250. Um, 
So they earned their victories. They made a better bike. That's it. Ducati made a better bike. They earned that. But why are the Japanese struggling? It's not that they're suddenly stupid. It's that they're just not focused. Look, Honda can do anything. I'm not even a Honda guy. I've never owned a Honda. Um, but there's just something about that company. If they put their mind to something, they crush it. Two wheels, four wheels, generators, robots, take your pick. Um, they're just not focused. And you hear this from the press as well, even in Europe, especially in Europe. Um, they're focused on selling vehicles and they're doing it. And they're building markets and they're future proofing. What is Ducati doing for the future? What is Triumph doing for the future? I see a lot of today and tomorrow, but I don't see a lot of a year or, you know, 10 years from now. So we'll so, see. So I, heard, I, I, I saw this week that, uh, that uh, Honda has announced um, that they are going to be all electric by 2040. Is that right? Yeah, yeah I think so. It's is, that a, it's a, is, that, is that cars too or just motorcycles? It's everything. And uh, it doesn't, you know, what a controversial announcement. It's, it's been legislated in every major market. Like, again, I, for those who don't want this to happen, I have sad news for you. Um, when ASGO India and China on two and four wheels, so go we. And like, we're just not an important market anymore. We're important, but we're not. We're not in the same league. We're dis North America is decidedly a second league market on two wheels, and is increasingly becoming less influential on four. Um, you know, and it's not because you know some you know conspiracy or whatever. It's just other markets have risen more than we have declined. It's not decline. It's it's that you know. India has a bigger middle class than the population of the entire United States. Um, so, you know, you can't compete with that kind of consumer firepower. Um, so if the, if India and China and the Europeans are saying you can't buy a combustion motorcycle after 2035, why would a Japanese manufacturer, the world's largest manufacturer, a company that has historically been the leader on things like ABS, making announcements back in 2001, I think, 2002, all Honda products will have ABS. I remember being at Yamaha at the time and senior Yamaha people were like, oh, that's premature. Where goes Honda, go we. And you know, if, if Yamaha is following Honda, everybody's following Honda. So yeah. One last uh, question about racing before we move on. Which is, um, and I'm going to make a bizarre analogy, but bear with me. Um, I'm I, 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 I kind of have an interest in these unlimited hydroplane boats that used to run like Spitfire engines, and they'd be these massive V12 engines that they'd, they'd modify them, and they'd make 3,000 horsepower, put it in a boat that floats across water. And spectacularly dangerous, and these huge rooster tails, and people died by the tenfold as they flipped over. Um, and having driven a hydroplane last year with an outboard motor, I can understand um, they are a little bit death defying. But, but they transitioned from uh, piston engines to turbine engines that came from uh, helicopters. And it kind of killed the sport because people just never seemed to react to or respond to turbine. They went from thunderboats, as they call them, to kind of these like whirring boats. And I wonder, and, and it and un unlimited hydroplane racing is struggling. It's almost non-existent now. There's like six boats running. So I wonder how the transition to enthusiasts will take to electric racing in MotoGP. Is this, and again, is this, I think I know what you're going to say. Is this one of these things that's just a matter of time and other generations will not have this affiliation with piston engines? Or is, is there a kind of romance that we're struggling to get away from? So, no, I think you're not, I think you're wrong about what you think I'm going to say. You know, I don't drive that giant Chrysler for any reason other than the sound. The sound and the silkiness. And what does that even mean when we say it's a silky engine? It still vibrates. So when we say silky, we're actually saying feedback. An electric car, and I own an electric car, 
is actually silky. There is no, the only feedback is the, the gentle ride, or the cushion of the seat, the music I'm listening to. So, you know, I get it. We're emotional beings. And racing is all about emotion. So I think the, the, the answer I get uh, give when it comes to will electrification kill racing, the answer is yes, some racing will die. Because the thrill on a board track is the, pardon me, is the unmuffled roar of a V-twin echoing against teak wood. Like that's, it's, that's why we go. We don't go because we want to see some empirically superior speed. No, it's it's the thrill, the sound, the smell. You go to a place like the Goodwood Festival of Speed, and the Mercedes vintage mechanics fire up a pre-war V12 F1 car. You know, the engine, the nose of the car is like 30 feet long, and flames shoot. I mean, that fills your soul you feel it your diaphragm shaking when that thing's revving and you know i just don't get that way about current f1 cars i think current f1 cars sound annoying as hell that is an empirically superior powertrain but it doesn't do anything to me so you're not wrong i think some forms of racing where sound is vital where traction and what i mean by traction is that like grip loses grip sliding if modern electronics are as good as they are, and they are, you can't really drift. But wait, along come the software people, and the newest Nissan GTR has drift mode. And you touch mm. the screen, and it goes to, are you really drifting the car? Or is the computer drifting the car? And the answer is, it's mostly the computer drifting the car. So at some point, you have to ask yourself, is this real? Is it, is it going to be as fun? Well, ask the people who try drift mode and they'll tell you it's fantastic fun. They don't care. So I think the answer is a little bit of both. And I would leave this with one positive, you know, one positive. You love uh, dirt track racing. You were a dirt track racer for a long time. Flat track, sorry. Yeah, yes, uh, I was. And, and, you know, I think it was Paris here in, in Canada. Uh, a beloved track was shut down. Um, yes. Partly because because, let, because of noise. What yeah. if, what if the future of sport bike racing, I'm going to be very specific about my language, isn't that we all trot out to these extremely expensive to own and maintain massive properties that are outside of the city where you got to eat a $20 shitty hot dog so that you can watch, you know, high performance MotoGP or Superbike or whatever AMA for one weekend a year. What if sport motorcycling could be in the city? What if it could be in a, 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 what if we set up a parking lot track and you're going, oh, that's not the same. It's not glamorous. Well, MotoGP wasn't glamorous. You look at the heyday in the 1960s. They literally put bales of hay on public roads and there was no fanfare. It was just real racing. What if we bring back real racing, bring it back to the city, bring it into a stadium, bring it into a, a Paris type, you know, quarter mile. And it could be five heats. Power doesn't matter. Batteries can be swapped in three minutes. So you run your heat, you do maybe two, three heats, then you swap a battery. Would you not rather have a thriving flat track circuit? And then substitute the sound of the V twin with a great soundtrack. Get a DJ. It's still going to be a great time. Michael, we can't have a conversation without touching on motorcycle design because I've learned a lot uh, from our friendship and conversations about design. And uh, I mean, one of the things that I think has has come up recently for me is that is that motorcycles, because of the nature of the the how visible their propulsion system is, is so different from a car. Because you can't yes. tell if a car, and you know, it used to be. It seemed with the like, you know, when the early electric or hybrid cars came out, like the the first Prius. For whatever reason, whenever there was electrification involved, they had to make them look dorky. And and that first Prius was just a hideous looking car. And the new Prius is a really beautifully designed car. Um, I don't know what the model names are or whatever, but it's a Prius and it's it's a gorgeous vehicle. Now. 
motorcycling is tricky because of, as I just said, the visibility of it. So, so where is design going? And are, and you know, we had the, the designer of the Stark uh, motocross bike, which I think is beautiful. And where are we going in terms of, of motorcycle design, both internal combustion and uh, and elect electric electrification? <laughs> I don't know why I, that seems so hard for me to say. That's uh, okay, Neil. It's, it's Th late thank on you a Friday. For it's late. <laughs> we've been, been inhaling. Drinking. We've been inhaling those two-stroke fumes. Um, Naturally. So I, I, I'm going to go back to my my earlier example of of your much, you know, hated two-stroke. Two-strokes aren't beautiful. Two-stroke engines are are not nice. They're disproportionately small for the size of a motorcycle, regardless of what category it is. And yet, there are some amazing. Like and I, and I mean, visually, there are two strokes that are that are extremely evocative, um, and that have crazy fandoms. And I go back to the Yamaha TZ. I mean, you can find boomers who are you know on crutches in their 80s who can still get teary eyed at the thought you know the memories of a TZ 750. I mean, you know the the artistry of the two stroke was found in the functionality of the exhaust. The exhaust became the design statement, the expansion chamber. Where is the expansion chamber? Is there a heat shield? Who wakes up in the morning and says, yeah, heat shield, that gets to be turned. But if done right, no, but if done right, you know, the back end of a two-stroke Grand Prix motorcycle when they had four stingers coming, wah, like, you know, if you were a guy in the motorcycles in the 80s, that was powerful. And of course, the Italians, the Kajiva, you know, 500, they artfully did these like machine gun outlets. It caught into the fairing that just with the with the exhaust tip and it all blackened. I mean, that was cool. So the same thing will apply to electrification. We're going to the, the good designers and I'm seeing it more and more. We're seeing it with designs like the Rivet Anthem and Ultraviolet, where they're saying like, OK, the Ultraviolet has a it's a let's call it full fairing sporty looking naked motorcycle but the panel is functional it's you know keeps things clean and tidy it hides some ugly fasteners that have to be there and then it slides open on one side so you can remove the battery to recharge it because their whole thesis is this is a small lightweight bike you just bring your battery inside that's how it works in asia so functionality great design is taking something that's required and making it aesthetic nobody designed cooling fins before we were making machines that required them and then over time cooling fins of air-cooled engines were applied artfully and the pitch between them and how big the radius the language and how they were cut out for a for a, a valve stem this became the art this became what made those designs stand out so we go wow that's beautiful so I, I think that answers what's going to happen in the future. And in terms of combustion, I don't see anything good. That's my that's my hot take that, you know, take from it what you will. I haven't seen almost any combustion modern motorcycle in the last four or seven years where I thought, wow, other than maybe the Husky Vitpillen, the 701 that, that blew up its engines. Um, beautiful looking machine, no compromise design. It was a new shape language. Really appreciate what Kiska did there. Um, but you know, everything is either a retread of an old trope. Oh, look, we've taken a 1980s Japanese adventure bike and now it's cool because we made it sort of semi-modern. So I don't see anything worthy of comment currently. I think bikes today are either really, really repetitious in design, um, most of the combustion stuff, or they're, frankly speaking, immature. And that a lot of designers, are, for reasons that are probably more to do with marketing um, at the OEM level, just don't know when to put their pencil down. Like, we just don't need, and I, I, I'm sorry to say this, but the the... The traditional brands famous for well acknowledged for great design like ktm like ducati i think are the worst offenders you know like 
stop with the line in the slot and you know how high should the tail be on the sport bike you know if we keep going eventually the tail of a panigale is going to be going up into the sky at like a 45 degree angle um because you know more aggression more aggression so i think i think combustion designers need to take a step back and mature and i think that the electrification community needs to double down on functionality why do you think that uh internal combustion engine motorcycles what is going on is is this it, does it have to do with the tools that are used to design motorcycles do you think is it is it is it is it because they're designed on a computer more so than than in than in clay or is do they still use clay i mean how are bikes made today well you know, like your previous guest said they absolutely use clay clay right. every serious manufacturer uses the clay process uh, it tends to be digital drawing transfer translated into a rough 3D model, which is then milled. And so you have a rough clay very quickly within like 24 hours, 36 hours of, of finalizing some sketches. And then you can go back and forth, which you never used to be able to do. You used to just be linear, like sketch to clay to final. Um, no, I don't blame the tools. It's a poor craftsman that blames their tools. Um I think car design, I think design in general is is very immature. It, it, I would liken to design today to the 1970s, the late 1970s, um, mm. like my Cordoba, <laughs> which is a ghastly piece of design. It's hideous. Um, but at the time, was a, I mean, the first year they sold almost a million of the damn things. Like, we're in the end of what I would call a Baroque cycle. Yeah. where designs go from modernism, cleanliness, uh, the purity, think 1960s cars, to a Baroque, which is the 1970s, where everything has this curly cue and vinyl top and, you know, fake wheel cover, wire wheel covers. Motorcycles now is just decorative. How much more decoration can I add on layers, wings, strokes, lines, vents, vents that mean nothing, that go nowhere? And, I, and to answer your question, why? I think we got there in little increments um, and the marketing thesis seems to be for the last five, seven years, if you talk to the MBA community, that more is better. And that's a very seventies way of thinking. If, if a slightly flared pair of pants is good, then a really flared pair of pants is better. Um, so, you know, wings, more wings, bigger wings, and someone's going to come out and make a great proportion, beautiful, motorcycle with three or four sophisticated little details and we'll have our 1992 ducati 916 moment where everybody goes oh that's it in closing a word from our sponsor ebay motors is here for the ride with some elbow grease fresh installs and a whole lot of love you transformed a hundred thousand miles in a body full of rust into a drive that's all your own brake kits led headlights whatever you need ebay motors has it and with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber and not cash. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Naturally, exclusions apply. Thank you for listening to The Lowdown Show.